we had an elder meeting and we were gathered in this meeting and we were looking yet again at the plans that had been part of discussions and deliberations and debates and consensus building and in the midst of that one of the elders said you know I came to Hope in 2008 and he said the experience for my family and my kids and for my wife and I has been incredible and he said now you know that I'm an elder and I kind of see what it takes and what goes on behind the scenes he said I almost feel like I should go back to some of the people that we're so committed to this in the very beginning and gave so much hard effort, money, vision, prayer to help it become what it is because those people and their investment is what's enabled me and my family to experience this. And I was pretty moved by that. First of all, that he would be thinking that way because it was very accurate. And secondly, I thought, you know, I could tell you who those people are. I could, I could give you names and addresses and you could go knock on their door and you could say, I just want to thank you. And it's real, and that's part of how it all plays out. So as we're embarking on this new season, we're going to start by taking a look at one of the foundational verses of the Bible. In Genesis 12, this is the call of Abraham. This is the beginning, in a certain way, of God expressing his heart for all people, unleashing this redemptive movement, and by calling a man named Abraham to be the, the progenitor of this whole thing as it plays out in the world. And you know, it's very interesting, but when God wants to express himself and when he wants to move in the world, he looks for people who will respond to his heart and to his vision. You see this play out over and over and over again in the Bible. So there are two particular things I wanna call your attention to as we look at the Genesis 12 section. The one is the number of times you see, I will. If you have a pen or a pencil, you could circle the number of times it says, I will. The other focal point is this little section that says, all peoples on earth. That's down on the fourth line, just a little from the right of the middle of what you've got written there. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So God is expressing and speaking into Abram's life. And if you look at the I wills, two things really get my attention. One is this is very future oriented. It doesn't say I did, it says I will. And the Bible is a very future oriented batch of literature. And the Bible also has a timeline, an historical timeline. There's a beginning and we read in Revelation that there's a time when God will consummate history. So it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then when we get to the end in Revelation where we see God consummating history. But if you live anywhere in between those, which we do, we're always wrapped up in this future-oriented vision and work of God. Now, there's work to do now, absolutely, but it's always about capturing our attention for the larger things that God wants to do in the future. And so it says, I will, I will, I will, I will, you will, I will, I will, and all peoples on earth will be blessed. You look at it and you begin to see that God is the mover here. God is clearly the one who's going to do this. I will, I will, I will, I will, he says to Abram. And when, when you trust me, Abram, then, then you will be a blessing. What does blessing in the Bible mean? It means that God will be very present with. So he says, I will do all this so that you will be a blessing. That is, you will be an agent to help people experience my presence and a relationship with me. And all peoples on earth will be blessed. Don't miss the all peoples part. It means all cultures, all ethnicities, all nations, all people, people groups, all languages, tribes, etc. All people. And this is the all heart of God. The all heart of God for all people. God is love, and so his heart is for all people. 
And why does he call Abram? And why is Abram the central person involved here? Because faith is at the center of this call. Faith, you see, is the very guts of it. It says in Romans 4, Abram trusted God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What does faith mean? It's a rather amorphous word. We use it in very general ways, very broad ways. We kind of slap it up everywhere. We say, well, it's a household of faith. It's a faith community. He's a person of faith. She's a woman of faith. But what does faith mean? The guts of it is trust. The guts of this question of faith is trust. It's trusting God. Now, this is not always easy for us, but this is the invitation. And these are the kind of people that God is looking for, people who will trust him. Abram was called and he responded and he trusted and this is why he's the progenitor of this redemptive movement of God. So God says to him, leave your country and your people and your father's house and go to the land I will show you. Now, let's be honest. Most of us would say, what do you mean? Leave and then you'll show me. You see, we would say, show me and maybe I'll go. But God says, Abraham, no, you go, and as you go, I will begin to unwrap this picture and this vision for you. You'll see more of me, and the vision will become ever clearer for you. But every one of us is like, no, I don't think so. You show me, and maybe I'll go. Not even you show me, and I'll definitely go. You show me, and maybe I'll go. Like, I want, I want a realist painting. I want a real picture. I want the GPS coordinates texted to me on my phone. And God says, Abraham, go and then I'll show you. This is a real struggle for us, particularly for us in, in the United States. We have this real sense of, you show me the picture exactly the way it's gonna go, and then I'll pray about it and see if the Lord's calling me to it. Like the Lord's like, I'm the one showing you the picture. Of course I'm calling you to it. But we struggle with this. We say, show us and maybe we'll go. God says, no, go and I'll show you. So a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that Cody Buchan and Grant Hayes and I were down in the Dominican Republic. And we were meeting and spending time with Carlos Sogard, who's a pastor, friend of ours, and many of yours who have taken trips down there. And over the years when I have visited developing nations, I'm reminded every time that culture and the way people look at life is very different than the way we do. A lot of things may not be as reliable. Transportation might not. The power can go off at any moment. We're not used to that. We make plans because we trust that all the stuff and the systems are going to work. But in a lot of developing countries, it doesn't work that way. So Carlos said to me on Tuesday, hey, we're going to have an outdoor worship service tonight. And I said, great. Where are we going to do it? He said, I'm not sure yet. And I said, okay. He said, but I want, I want you guys to come and be involved in it. And I said, okay. Uh, how many people are going to be there? He said, I don't know. I said, well, what time is it going to start? He said, when we get there. And I said, how long is it going to last? He said, I have no idea. And I said, who's going to preach? And he said, you are. <laughs> so I wasn't terribly surprised by that. I had a feeling that was coming. But I said to him, like, what part of town are we going to be in? Right? Are we going to be in sort of a nice part of town or are we going to be in a challenging part of town? Uh, do these people come with weapons? Do they like Christians? I need to be prayed up and ready for what I'm going to say. So I said, well, what should I preach and teach on? He said, whatever God gives you to talk to these people about. And then he says to me, David, you Americans are insufferable. You demand to know every detail. It doesn't work that way. He said, just come with me and when I say preach, preach. Okay, and that's what we did. And it was a wonderful experience. About 80 people, 90 people gathered on the side of this dirt road in a poor section of Atamayor in the Dominican Republic. Trust, so challenging for us. And it is the guts of, the central matter in faith. Okay, now this may sound a little goofy to you, but if you've read Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages, over the years, as I have grown in my relationship with God, if you could say it, I've come to believe that trust is God's number one love language. He is longing for people to trust him. He loves it when people will trust him. And this is hard for us, right? Because we're like, oh, that's scary. I don't know if everything's going to go great. Of course, this is why trust is central to a relationship with God. But he longs to find people, churches, ministries, who trust him. 
And then he longs to provide for them and take them on this adventure of life. You know, the other thing he longs and loves to do, he loves to surprise us. Think about this, for, for, for you who have children, I bet almost everybody who's a parent, one time or another, or maybe more, has hatched a plan that was to surprise your kids with something really fun. And, and you delight in the idea that you're working on this plan that they have no idea about, and then you're gonna surprise them. And it's gonna be something they never imagined, and it's gonna be really fun. Where do we get that idea that we love to surprise our kids with these joyful things? I think it comes straight from the heart of the one who made us. He loves to surprise us with incredibly joyful experiences. But we can't get surprised if we demand to know every detail beforehand. It's like wanting to surprise your kids on Christmas and they demand to know all their presents beforehand. So God is looking for people who trust him. Individuals, yes. Churches, yes. Ministries, yes. As I've come to think this over in life, I've come to think that here in our culture, many of us, maybe without knowing it, have developed a vision of life which is, when I have certainty, then I will take steps forward. And when I have certainty and I can see that picture of what it looks like, then of course it's supposed to go according to that picture. So this little formula here, certainty, if we live with a vision which is I need certainty, when you add circumstances to that, circumstances now we begin to know, particularly if you've got a couple of decades or more of life under your belt, the circumstances often do not go according to the picture of certainty that we thought was in place, maybe thought was like a guarantee, a sure thing. So if we're living with this vision that we think certainty is what life is going to be, when you add the reality of circumstances to that, and when things don't go according to the certainty we envision, we run into crises. Crises of faith, crises of our lives, crises that things aren't the way we thought they should be. It's a formula, and it's a way that many of us live. But when circumstances don't go according to this certainty that we imagined, then we experience these crises, huge disappointments, huge heartbreaks, crises of faith. Is God reliable? Is he true? Is he real? But the biblical call is quite different than this. Notice when God is calling Abram here, he's not just calling this man. He's teaching him how life actually works. He says, trust me and I'll show you. And once we begin to have a little bit of experience behind us, we realize this actually is the way life works. Like we realize it doesn't always go according to plan. Things come along we never envisioned, never imagined. Wonderful things, challenging things. So God's call to Abraham is trust me. And if you look at this formula, trust and add circumstances to it, well, those circumstances will not go according to a certainty vision, but if our vision of life is trusting God, then when the circumstances come, some happy, some hard, the result for us is growth. We become more compassionate, deeper people, people for whom life means more, relationships mean more. This becomes a kind of expanding and growing heart and faith life. But the previous formula, certainty plus circumstances equals crisis, becomes a kind of shrinking, self-centered life of difficulty and disappointment. We know that the way life actually works is, yes, you have an idea of the direction you're headed, and God says as much with Abraham. Go in the right direction, but I'll show you the specifics as you go. And we know this is actually the way life works because there's so many things that come along in our circumstances that we never could have anticipated. So let me tell you a little story. Okay, so a young couple who recently got engaged, and I said to the guy, did you ask her dad? Did you talk to her dad? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, how did that conversation go? And he said, you know what? We were talking, and I said to him, I love your daughter, and I want to ask her to marry me. Is that okay with you? And I said, well, and what did he say? He said, well, he was like quiet. It seemed like for like two hours, he was like silent. I said, it was probably like two seconds, but you know, he did have to figure out what am I gonna say to that? And when I asked him, what did he say? What did he say? He told me, and I got actually kind of choked up about it. The girl's father said to him, 
Do you promise to love her until death do you part? Now, if you're a dad of a daughter and a guy wants to marry your daughter, you might have a whole list of questions you'd like to ask. Like, how are you going to provide for her? How about show me your 1040? I want to know if you're financially secure. What's your income stream? How can you guarantee for me that she's going to be well cared for in the future? I mean, these are reasonable questions, but the fact of the matter is we don't have any guarantees about that stuff. And if you've lived a little life, you know that. Things can change. Things can, can go great, and we can have more money than we ever imagined, and unexpected, unanticipated things can happen, the economy, jobs, etc. You see, part of what got my attention about what this father asked him was, he's getting to really the only question that really is at the core of the matter. He's asking him a trust and a faith question. He's saying to him, do you promise to love her until death do you part? And I think there's wisdom in it, which is he didn't ask him about a whole bunch of other stuff. We don't know how life is going to go with all that other stuff. But what I want to know is, do you promise to love her until death do you part? That's the question. And he's focusing on trust and faith. We know that we can't anticipate all the circumstances and things that will happen on the journey. But he wants to know, do you promise to love her until death do you part? He's hit right on the core of it. And this is the kind of invitation that God's giving us. Trust me, move through the experiences of life, and I will be with you. Very future-oriented. I will, I will, I will, I will. Shows up throughout the Bible, very future-oriented. And you know what we know, of course, the future belongs to future generations. And one of the things that's so exciting about this Hope Places deal is the lion's share of the financial initiatives are investing in students and children. They're being invested in future generations. Okay, so this is the faith part, but now I just want to take a moment and talk about the all part. Remember, we talked about all peoples, the all perspective of God's heart. So last Monday morning, I woke up with the word all beating in my brain. Like, wake up, and the word all is beating in my brain. So I just start thinking about it, and what comes to mind to me is the Great Commission, Jesus saying, therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Then I think of 1 Timothy 2 that says, God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Let's take a look at these. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The word there in Greek is ethnoi, that's ethnic all ethnicities, all people groups, every race, every color, every tribe, every place, every country. Now, here's where this kind of call to God's all heart can become a little bit challenging for us. If we're really honest, I think sometimes what we want to say is, really? Really? I like it the way it is. I like the people who are here. It's just about the size I want it. I'm very comfortable with it. I feel comfortable with the people that are here. What if a lot of other people come and I don't really know them? And what if they're different than me? And you see, we start thinking self-centeredly, self-interestedly in the midst of the backdrop where God is pouring out his all heart of God, all people, all nations, all people groups. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, the Apostle Paul, writing inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, maybe you've heard me say this before at Hope, but this word saved is a little tricky. The word saved biblically means forgiven, restored, healed, made whole. We're not talking about a Bible beat down from an angry Jesus. We're talking about the offer of God's heart that all people would be forgiven, restored, healed, made whole in a relationship with him. God wants that for all people. And God's looking for people who share his heart for all, this all heart of God. So you know what I noticed? In Genesis, it's God speaking to Abram, all peoples. In Matthew, it's Jesus speaking to the disciples about all nations. And in Timothy, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul to the church about all people being saved. So I'm like, okay, God speaking to Abraham, Jesus speaking to the disciples, the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. Like all three members of the Trinity seem pretty committed to this all people's idea. And I, you know, this isn't like sophisticated theology, but I'm like, if all three members of the Trinity are riding the same horse, it's got to be a big deal. And it really gets my attention. 
So when we started Hope 17 years ago, we had this heart to try to create a place that expressed God's love for, for all people. And it's incredible how he has been doing that. Is it possible to believe in that mission more today than I did 17 years ago? I do believe in it even more today. Why? I've got some of my own experiences. I've been through some of my own ups and downs and challenges. I've got more scars in my own life. I've seen God express himself in his glory in people's lives. I believe in this heart of God to bring all people into a life of reconciliation, restoration, forgiveness, and wholeness than I ever have. And so here's his all heart being expressed. Picking up on that, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I mean, that's a lot of all. I'm doing all, everything possible that I can think of to express the all heart of God. And so, you know, people sometimes feel a call to ministry. But, you know, churches have a call. Churches have a call. Just like ministries have a call, people have a call. For sure, in the most comprehensive sense, the all heart of God that starts in Genesis and runs all the way through the pages of this book is the main current of the big story of God's redemptive heart. And here's what's incredible to begin to realize. We are now part of that story. We're now in that current and God is inviting us, calling us to be a part of this all heart of God as his redemptive movement, this river that runs through all the pages of the Bible keeps rolling forward, future oriented, rolling forward. You know, almost everything we do as Christians is always a pay it forward concept. We're doing it for the people that might come, the people that might benefit. And why do Christians do that? Because somehow the all heart of God has begun to move into our hearts. It's almost always a pay it forward kind of idea. Here's the challenge. Trust is challenging, isn't it? Not many people or churches or ministries will trust God at this level that we're talking about and not many will take his all people heart seriously. But we're part of that stream now. And 17 years ago, God started this, and now that stream is bigger and the current is stronger and the invitation is louder. So where does it all go when you, when you follow that river throughout the pages of the Bible? It began in Genesis, it takes us to Revelation. Look what it says in Revelation 7. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. That call with Abram in Genesis 12, Jesus saying all nations to the disciples, Paul telling Timothy in the church, God wants all people, comes to this incredibly consuming place where the heart of the Father has this multitude that no one can count of people who've been reconciled, redeemed, forgiven, and made whole in a relationship with him. That's his heart, and it's his invitation to us. Let's take a moment, and I want to pray together as God calls us on this next season and this journey. Father God, it's just so easy to sort of think, but all I was doing was going to church. All I was doing was looking for a place that my kids might like. All I was doing was looking for maybe some music or some teaching that I liked. And then all of a sudden, Lord, we've begun to realize that you're calling us to get swept up in this current, this redemptive movement of your heart for all people. And so, Lord, would you work in each of our hearts individually, but then in a broad way, all of our hearts together, so that you are the center of what we're trying to do. That it's not about ego, it's not about monument building, it's about your glory and your expression in people's lives. And would you help us now over these next five weeks, Lord, to have an ever-growing, expanding vision for your all-people heart. And will you help us to get in that current, that river that's flowing through the entirety of the scriptures, Lord. We're asking for your help in this vision through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. 
Amen. Thus, as we close our service, we're going to sing.